Welcome everybody and uh, welcome to this first Opera Welcome webinar. I am Giovanni Sini, architect at Italian Ministry of Culture and Opera Project Manager. Before we get started, uh, please switch off your microphone so we can uh, have a better uh, audio. Uh, before we get started, I bring uh, you warm greetings and wishes on behalf of our Ministry Regional Secretary, architect Corrado Azzolini, which uh, cannot be here today. Uh, Opera, as you know, is a project co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Uh, and the main project's objective is to reveal and share the knowledge pattern embedded in the cultural heritage conservation process, which is currently ongoing here in Marche region, as well as in the 2016 Central Italy earthquake zone. Sharing this knowledge with local communities and a wider audience may lead to a real involvement of people in the conservation and reconstruction process since they are the actual owner of the cultural heritage. This experience started in 2019 in collaboration with our partners, the University of Minio, the Cyprus University of Technology, the University of Ljubljana and the University of Ferrara. As you know, our project was uh, strongly impacted by the COVID outbreak and we were obliged to postpone the activities planned last year in 2020. In spite of those problems, the project continued to grow and to attract interest, both at local and uh, international level. In this period of transition, for, we waiting for the execution of the workshop program in the next summer. We want to propose these uh, three welcome webinars. A moment of mutual meeting and discussion on different experiences about the relationship between heritage cultural identity and local communities in post-disaster scenarios. I'm really happy today uh, to welcome the 28 uh, cultural operators coming uh, all around Europe, uh, which we have been selected uh, to participate in the workshop program and in the organization of the open site events. You have all been chosen to be a part of our project due to your skills, and uh, sorry, I have a problem with the Facebook. Okay. Uh, do, come back. Uh, you have all been chosen to be a part of our project due to your skills and mutual passion for cultural heritage. Your passions help us all to focus on the cultural heritage conservation today's challenges, be contaminated by new disciplines and technologies and to be people oriented. Today's webinar is organized as a round table discussion. Mr. Giovanni Boccardi will moderate the discussion by submitting questions to each speaker focusing on their direct experience in post-disaster scenarios. Mr. Boccardi, member of the Project Scientific Committee, is architect conservator and former chief of the Emergency Preparedness and Response Unit of UNESCO Culture Sector. Before the roundtable, my colleague Sara Trotta will briefly present the current opera project status and will introduce in detail the webinar topic. I would now like uh, to welcome and really thanks uh, our speakers for sharing their experience with us today. Manuel Bernardini is a software developer based in Camerino, Italy, president of Comitato Rocca Varano, member of Club UNESCO in Tolentino and Terre Maceratesi, former vice president of the association Io Non Crollo uh, and project stakeholder of the Action Arch Saving Cult Cultural Heritage. Lucia Patrizio Gunning and Barnaby Gunning. Lucia Patrizio Gunning is a lecturer at University College of London. She is a modern historian specializing in cultural heritage with a particular focus on the history of collecting for European museums. Barnaby Gunning is an architect and programmer based in London. 
Following the 2009 L'Aquila earthquake, they created and coordinated several web-based projects to engage local people in documenting their cultural heritage. Anki Petersen, Anki is an opera project participant, liaison officer in Dutch Royal Armed Forces, cultural property protection and cultural emergency response. Matteo Pompei, opera project participant, freelance geologist and mayor of Monte San Martino in Italy. And Rocco Zarnic. Rocco Zarnic is a right height professor of building materials at the University of Ljubljana. He dedicated most of his research career to the problems of the earthquake safe construction and reconstruction of earthquake damaged buildings. I would also like to remind you the webinar will be recorded and uh, it is currently live broadcasted on the project's Facebook page. I really hope you will enjoy today and the next two webinars of debate and networking. So please, Sara, let's introduce the project status and the webinar topic. Yes, thank you, Giovanni. Do you hear me? Do you see my screen? Okay, do you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Just a few words, not to bore you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar entitled Setting the Scene. Even if only in a virtual way, we are happy to meet all of you and build an exchange of ideas on some issues on the Opera project. Even if in a different way, we can elaborate interesting ideas for the project's implementation. As you know, to the, to the COVID-19 emergency, the project activities have been necessarily modified and partly shifted between 2022 and 2021 20, and 2022. The impossibility of carrying out the training workshops last year forced us to reflect on a different implementation activities and a different way of involving the participants selected for the workshops. Regarding the organization of the workshops, we would like to give you some more details as following. About the workshop entitled Digital Technologies for Knowledge and Promotion of Cultural Heritage during the restoration and reconstruction process, planned in Cyprus in the next May, at the time being, and as already communicated in the last days, due to the strong restri restrictions on mobility still in force throughout Europe, it will, it will be therefore carried out online during the same week. In the upcoming days, you will receive further information and the workshop agenda. About the workshop planned for the next June in Portugal, entitled the Traditional and Innovative Methods for Structural, Structural Monitoring and Safety Assessment of Built Cultural Heritage, it seems to be possibly implemented face to face, but we await more information by April from the Portuguese partner. About the workshop planned for September in Italy, entitled Designing a Cultural Event in a Post-Earthquake Restoration Sites, Methods and Tools, we are confident about the possibility to carry out it as planned in Camerino. We've communicated the workshop modalities by the end of May. If the workshop's participants have some questions or doubts about the revised way of workshops implementation, we'll dedicate some minutes for the discussion at the end of this webinar. While we are disappointed for the different way these workshops will be partially carried out, we however believe that the project's potential can be unchanged, thanks to your contribution and your active participation. This is the reason why we organized the present webinar and the next two. We realized that it was necessary to start working together as possible on the project background in order to actively participate to the workshops later. This webinar was to be also an occasion to meet each other and share innovative ideas, wishful thoughts, and, but also doubts and questions. Indeed, we believe that the pandemic we are experiencing, like other emergency events such as the earthquake itself, must be seen as an occasion for meditation and change. And these events, despite their gravity, can be used as a moment of personal and community growth. 
we are learning that if these events are not answered as a community, having all together the same behaviors and not responding as a single attitude, any solution could be useless, even from an economic point of view. Ironically, since we are all experiencing a disrupted event for our lives, we are now able to understand which feeling these populations leave after the earthquake, isolated, forced to leave their homes besides their lifestyle to, due to an external event, and without knowing how and when they will return to an usual life. Ironically, this is the right time to immerse ourselves in this reflection and take the role of someone who has already experienced a disastrous, e disastrous event. We have also learned that cultural heritage can be seen as an element of community unification because it is part of a common life to which everyone hangs on in a difficult period and it could be exploited following this point of view, even if, if even when it is distant and unreachable. We realize that the enjoyment of beauty helps to face hard life moments and enjoying cultural heritage can be a need and not only an unnecessary life factor. The emotional side of cultural heritage must also be considered and analyzed where possible. Indeed, the effects of disasters on cultural heritage have a deep impact on the conserved communities, both material and psychological. Conversely, the protection of cultural assets and the continuity of cultural practices at time of crisis has shown to be a critical factor of resilience and the condition for lasting recovery. The protection of cultural heritage from disasters and its rapid recovery and rehabilitation in emergency situations is nowadays recognized as a key humanitarian and security issue, for example, within the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030, which also emphasizes the importance of placing communities at the heart of disaster prevention, response, and recovery. Despite the above, local communities are very often not engaged in the protection of their heritage from disasters, nor involved in critical decisions regarding its recovery. In the aftermath of major disasters, inhabitants of affected areas are typically evacuated and prevented from accessing their houses and cultural landmarks. While the safety considerations leading to these measures are understandable, their impact on the affected populations may be considerable. Very often, indeed, this forced separation lasts for months, if not years, and sometimes because becomes permanent, severing the people from their heritage and reducing their ability to enjoy, participate in, and transmit their culture with devastating effects on the resilience of communities. Despite the best intentions of all the authorities involved, the focus is too often on the physical recovery and protection of the main monuments and works of art, with less attention paid to the complex web of cultural relationships that brings a community together and with its local built and natural environment, which has been disrupted by the disaster. Major disasters result often in the creation of new cultural values, either associated with the need to memorialize a tragic event or simply because of the natural process of social change and transformation that take place after catastrophes, including large reconstruction projects and relocation of people and their activities. The empowering and full engagement of affected populations in the cultural heritage conservation process after a disaster, in conclusion, is critical to support their resilience. It may foster a deep local cultural regeneration and will also help specialists in their technical choices and conservation strategies. Against this big ground, what will be the implications of placing communities at the center of disaster risk prevention, response and recovery for cultural heritage? 
what are the main issues to be, to be considered, and how would this be done in practice. Today's webinar will begin to explore this complex question, building on the collective experience of the participants in the OPERA project by focusing on three related issues as follows. What are the local communities' needs linked to cultural heritage in a post-emergency scenario? What are the challenges that local communities face in a post-disaster response situation when defining their possible role in relation to cultural heritage? Which should be the overall approach to the recovery and reconstruction process, particularly as regards the cultural heritage? And how may the local community be actively involved? These three aspects will be examined through the upcoming roundtable, thanks to the contribution of the speakers, who will bring experiences and case studies from different points of view. We hope that all the guests will actively participate in the discussion as to create alternative or complementary observations about the proposed theme and establish the basis for the work groups planned for the next two webinars. Thank you for your attention and have a good job. Thanks, Sara. Uh, your presentation uh, is very useful to focus the, the webinar topics. Now, without uh, any further delay, let's move on uh, on the roundtable discussion. I will now ask the roundtable moderator, Mr. Giovanni Boccardi, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Issini, my homonymous Giovanni. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be a moderator at this webinar, whose topic is uh, very interesting. I would like to start by thanking uh, the, the Opera Project for asking me to play this uh, role. I'm delighted to be here and to be able to have this conversation with all of you today. Um, we have six speakers. All of them have a very rich experience and background, so I'd like to move on quickly to go straight to them. But before I have been asked to make some housekeeping announcement about how uh, you can participate. As Mrs. Strotta said, we hope for a participation, not just a one-way uh, communication. So um, um, I am told that everyone can post the questions or comments on the chat of this virtual meeting. And there is also a Facebook uh, uh, platform, I believe, where also comments uh, can be posted. Uh, the, the staff will um, make sure that uh, these are brought to our attention and that uh, the people who made those uh, comments or questions can intervene. Um, I also uh, would like to tell you that if you want to intervene in person, you can uh, uh, use the um, icon in the control panel to raise your hand and you will be allowed to uh, intervene uh, in person during the discussion. Uh, as uh, Mr. Isini said, if you are not speaking, please mute your microphone so that uh, background noises don't uh, disturb the, the conversation. Now, um, having said that, I would like to start by our first speaker, Mr. Manuel Bernardini an active member of the community of Camerino, one of the, of the, of the uh, villages that were, or towns rather, that were most uh, affected by the earthquake of uh, 2016 uh, in the Marche region. Uh, Mr. Bernardini um, is also uh, actively engaged in many associations. I would like to ask him, um, uh, to tell us uh, what he witnessed uh, after the earthquake struck. I understand that uh, your town was uh, um, locked. Uh, it was declared as a red zone. People could not uh, go in anymore. Uh, so how did the people uh, respond? How did this impact uh, the local community and what did they do? Uh, I understand Mr. Bernardini um, will reply in Italian. I will then translate what he said into English. Mr. Bernardini, please, you have the floor. Grazie mille. Allora, mi scuso per l'utilizzo dell'italiano, ma fra l'emozione, la materia che non è la mia e il fatto che sono tutte cose che mi toccano da vicino, preferisco utilizzare eh, l'italiano e quindi evitare di, di dire cose non precise. 
Allora, innanzitutto il discorso sulla zona rossa è che per quello che per molti è zona rossa, per noi è un, era un luogo vivo. Quelle che sono dei beni culturali per noi sono parte di quella che è la nostra cultura e quella nostra tradizione. Noi abbiamo la statua di Sisto V, che è la statua centrale della piazza, che è il nostro luogo di ritrovo, cioè ci si ritrova sotto la statua. Abbiamo il Palazzo Ducale, che è quattrocentesco, che per noi è il Belvedere di Camerino. Abbiamo la Rocca del Borgia, costruita da Cesare Borgia, che sono i giardini in cui usciamo. Abbiamo il corso che è il luogo dove noi facevamo le vasche, cioè le passeggiate. Tutte queste cose per noi non sono semplicemente il bene culturale, ma sono proprio una parte integrante di quella che è la nostra vita, o meglio, di quella che era la nostra vita. Perché voi potete immaginarvi che eh, il corso è stato riaperto a gennaio 2021, quindi quasi cinque anni dopo la sua chiusura. Tanti giovani, tanti ragazzi eh, non si ricordano cosa è il centro, alcuni neanche lo conoscono, quindi potete immaginarvi come per loro il centro è visto come un qualcosa di alieno, come un qualcosa dove non ci si può, mm, non ci si può neanche avvicinare. Let me, let me translate, otherwise I will forget, because I, I'm afraid I won't be able to follow. So Mr. Bernardini started by apologizing because uh, he won't be able to respond in English. Don't worry, it's fine. He said that uh, the issues uh, touch him personally, so he's also under some emotion. We, we get it. Um, he also uh, said that the red zone of the Camerino uh, town, um, which is extremely rich in cultural heritage, he mentioned a statue of the Ducal Palace, uh, the main Uh, course of the gardens. This is all uh, cultural heritage, but to the people of Camerino, this is also their life, their meeting places, uh, their habits, their viewpoints uh, associated with lots of memories. So this um, for them has, of course, has a special meaning and uh, the earthquake uh, disrupted uh, their life in a very significant way. It has, uh, by way of example, he explained that uh, the main Avenue, the main uh, corso of the village, which was closed in 2016, was only reopened in January of 2021, so five years later. Please, Mr. Bernardini, go on. E quindi, come dicevo, i più giovani vedono Camerino da fuori, la vedono quasi come se fosse molto spesso noi sottolineiamo con amara ironia che sembra quasi un, un momento di assedio dove i cittadini sono fuori in attesa di poter entrare dalle porte delle mura di Camerino. E come abbiamo reagito a tutta questa cosa qui? Abbiamo reagito come in genere eh, siamo soliti reagire come marchigiani, cioè nel senso rimboccandoci le maniche. Voi immaginatevi che prima del terremoto c'erano oltre 90 associazioni a Camerino eh, che si trovavano quasi tutte con una sede nel centro storico. Infatti con l'associazione di cui sono stato per due anni vicepresidente, eh, una delle prime cose che abbiamo detto è che abbiamo bisogno di un luogo dove ritrovarci. Quindi abbiamo ho lanciato una campagna di raccolta fondi che ha raccolto oltre 300 mila euro per costruire un quartiere di associazioni. Ma allo stesso tempo non ci siamo mossi solo noi, ma si è mosso anche l'amministrazione comunale. Come si è mossa? Avevamo il rischio di chiudere l'archivio di Stato e sono intervenuti per mantenerlo aperto. In questo momento stanno spostando la biblioteca valentiniana e quindi salvando oh, quelli che sono dei libri eh, anche con svariati secoli alle spalle. Eh, è stata realizzata una piccola sede temporanea per i musei civici perché, come appunto sottolineavo prima, tutta questa parte della nostra storia mh, per alcuni è banalmente storia sui libri di testo, per noi invece parte delle radici e considerate che sono fondamentali le radici se pensiamo che nella zona del cratere dal 2016 al 2020 sono, sono andati via oltre mille abitanti e Camerino dal 2020 al 2021 da solo ha avuto un'ulteriore perdita di abitanti di 300 persone 300 persone su un, un paese di 6.000 abitanti sono veramente tante per un anno Thank you, thank you so much. So you explained how the, for the younger generation, the, 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 the closure of the historic center for five years has had a, a very severe impact because they were not able to, to leave the historic center for an important part of their life. You mentioned that the people are standing outside of the, sea, of the city and you get the image of a siege, of a military siege, you know, people sort of all waiting to get in. But at the same time, you said that, um, the population reacted very strongly 
uh, you mentioned that before the earthquake, there were up to 90 uh, civil society associations, if I got the number right, uh, and that all of them had their own uh, headquarters, uh, so to speak, uh, within the historic center. So they, they all had to find a new way to continue their, their activities. And uh, you mentioned that, uh, in fact, a sort of uh, small citadel of uh, local associations was created, you know, where everyone could, uh, you know, meet again. Uh, you also referred to important initiatives taken by the public authorities for the evacuation and the rehabilitation of the library. The fact that a new temporary seat for the civil museum was, uh, was established so that people could you know, resume access to their cultural heritage. And then you concluded by giving us some figures about uh, the incredible number of people who left the area affected by the earthquake uh, over the past five years. Uh, you mentioned uh, over a thousand people, which of course may not sound like a huge number in absolute terms, but compared to the, the, the population of Camerino, which you said is 6,000 is uh, quite considerable. So we hope that these people will be able to, to come back uh, in the near future. Is there anything else you would like to say, Mr. Bernardini, at this point? Uh, no, thanks, but it's not uh, building the Quartier of Associazioni, but we are building uh, in, uh, in this time. Thanks. OK, thank you. We, we now move on to the second speaker, or rather speakers, because it's two, uh, two people. Lucia Patrizio Gunning and Barnaby Gunning, um, who are based in London, but uh, I understand Lucia is from L'Aquila, and uh, together they set up a very interesting project uh, in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake that affected L'Aquila in 2009. Um, I think it was the 9th of April, so we're almost... Uh, <clears throat> to reaching an anniversary there. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask uh, Lucia and Barnaby, I don't know who will be presenting, maybe Barnaby first, I, I believe, to, to present this project and to uh, explain um, why you created it, um, what was the intention of the project. Uh, perhaps uh, I will ask you a follow-up questions, please. Okay. Yeah, Barnaby, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, so the, the earthquake was on the 6th of April. Um, so um, Lucia and I both live in London, um, but we have a home in the centre of L'Aquila. And Lucia and our two eldest children were both, or they were all born there, and they were in the area when the earthquake struck on the 6th of April. Between 2010 and 2014, we initiated and were involved in four participative projects. Come facciamo, L'Aquila 3D, Noi L'Aquila, and Hello L'Aquila. They're represented here by the four patron saints of the city. Immediately after the earthquake, a red zone was established, like in Camerino, a red zone was established that covered the city centre, partly for health and safety reasons and partly to prevent looting. Um, this meant that people were excluded from the city centre and they lost the connection with the emotional heart of their city and felt that the city had been taken from them, first by the earthquake and subsequently by the government. At the same time, the outside perception of L'Aquila was that the problems of the city had been resolved. Now, whenever we were in the area um, or meeting with our friends from L'Aquila, we kept on hearing the same phrase, which was, come facciamo, what can we do? And we wanted to find a way to let ordinary citizens share their knowledge of how things were with an audience abroad and in the rest of Italy. And this led to a first project. Uh, it was kind of a mashup of consumer and professional software. And the idea was that people could upload their photographs and add information about where the photos were taken and when they were taken so that they could be browsed on a map and geolocated. And the information that was embedded into the photographs in this process has stayed with them so that even now, if you download an image, you can see exactly when and where it was taken and by whom. In fact, the site we built didn't really care where in the world images were taken or located, but if they were in an area that was within the geographic area of L'Aquila, they would automatically be added into our database and saved to a server. 
The second project we carried out was called L'Aquila 3D, and it used consumer 3D modeling tools to build a model of the city center. We did this with the help of Google, and we had two streams to the project. The first stream extended our initial project by photographing every building and space in the city center. And the second stream involved teaching volunteers how to use Google software to geo-model the buildings. So over seven weekends, we photographed 600 urban blocks. We built an archive of about 75,000 photographs, and we worked with more than 500 volunteers to do this. We had people from teenagers to pensioners and from all walks of life. Uh, this is a group of clowns taking photographs in the city centre. In parallel, Google provided educators to carry out 3D modelling classes, and they ran six one-day courses in a temporary structure at the University of L'Aquila. It was a challenging project, largely because of the complex irregular shapes of the buildings and the hilly topography of the city. And the difficulty in doing this was exacerbated by all the scaffolding and temporary structures that got in the way of the buildings. But by the end of the project, we'd modeled about half of the city center and we had teams from Brazil and Sicily who joined in remotely. Now, although Google didn't provide financial uh, sponsorship, the Google Earth team were really supportive of the project. And it resonated within Google Italy, where a member of the Rome office, Alicia Ripetto, uh, came up with an idea to bring together three Google projects, uh, Google Maps, Picasso image sharing, and YouTube, with the idea of creating a place that people could record their memories. The project was called Moil Aquila, and we worked with Google London to develop the initial site. And it created a place where people could up upload their own photographs, they could record video memories, and they could also link back into the 3D modeling project that we were doing. The project also involved creating free internet access in the city centre, and we made an info box that was used to launch the project in June 2011, and that remained as a resource for the city until last year. The fourth project we do was called Hello L'Aquila, and this was actually the work of one participant from the L'Aquila 3D project, Graziano Di Crescenzo, and he spent six months uh, creating street view for the whole of the city centre, um, including some building interiors and views from a tower crane. He did all of this using his mobile phone, and so we built a website around it that let people walk around the city centre, send virtual postcards, and to share specific views over social media with Facebook and Twitter. Subsequent to all this, we've carried out workshops with local school kids and taught them how to use their phones to do 3D scanning. And the thing we found is that these kind of emerging technologies, on, particularly on mobile devices, they're a really great way to get young people involved with their uh, cultural heritage and reconnected with their city. At the time we were doing this, we'd have to upload hundreds and hundreds of images to a server and then wait several hours for a 3D model to be created. And the thing that I'm really impressed by is how over 10 years now, I can just get my mobile phone out and get an incredible quality 3D scan out of it. All of the initiatives we carried out use the social media platforms, particularly Facebook and Twitter, to create engagement and outreach. And this is in 2010. So Facebook was really taking off as a platform for people to create a kind of virtual community. A lot of the people who've been kicked out of the center of L'Aquila use that as a way to, to kind of come together. And things like the Popola delle Cariole were also very active in this period. And our experience was that these projects were really useful um, psychologically for the people who took part in them, who felt disenfranchised and abandoned, and then found that there was something they could actually do that would re-engage them with their cultural heritage and, and, and create a community of people working together. And subsequently, we found that a lot of the photographs we've taken are actually really precious because they're a historic record of how things were, and that helps protect cultural heritage that's really at risk of being either uh, damaged or stolen. And my kind of looking back on it after 10 years, the thing that I can really see is that actually these kind of consumer technologies and things you can do with your mobile phones are an amazing way to engage ordinary citizens with their cultural heritage and, and get them back involved in, in their city, particularly in an environment like the uh, Zona Rossa, where you've been excluded physically from the space of your city. Thank you. Thank you, Barnaby. Was that all? Did you? Yeah, add I think I've covered everything. If there's anything else you'd like to add, wonderful. I think it was a wonderful, uh, I think, uh, example of uh, how 
you know, community can be involved directly through this amazing technologies in, uh, in basically uh, both having access to a site which is locked, uh, you know, and uh, which is being declared as a red zone, but also, and here I would like to hear maybe Lucia's uh, opinion, in uh, being able to express a different way, a different idea of cultural heritage, not just the high, you know, end monuments and works of art, but also what is closer to people, maybe local memories, places that have significance, you know, the... the yes, thank you, Giovanni. Can you uh, react quickly on this, you know, we... Yeah, so um, to reconnect to what Manuel Bernardini said, um, the reason why we did the info box in town was because we realized that uh, young people were just going uh, on the outskirts of town in shopping centers and they had lost the sense of what their town was like. And in L'Aquila we also have the problem of kids that were born during the earthquake and that 10 years after the earthquake they still don't know their town. So we wanted to create a place where youths could meet and spend time and reconnect to the town. And we felt that this in a way provoked a reaction to other people, um, making them think that they could react, that they needed to do something, that they needed to reconnect to the town. And um, the other thing that we, I, I specifically felt um, uh, following these four projects we did and a few years in between, um, I've continued to think, what does it mean to reconstruct after a disaster? And I've realized that the main element that um, impacted on us was the lack of communication from the authorities, from the local authorities, um, and in a way from the state. So we were being given what we needed. Sorry. This will be a topic for another round of questions. So okay. Yes. Yes. yes, so um, in a way, what I found that we need is to educate citizens that cultural heritage can bring well-being, can help you to recover psychologically. And one thing I found we don't have is an education in uh, preparing to uh, protect that cultural heritage because disasters happen all the time unexpectedly and we often find that we don't have um, archives, photographic archives and cataloging of that heritage. Thank you so much Lucia. Um, let's move on to uh, another speaker. I would like to now uh, ask Enki Peterson um, who is a liaison officer in the Dutch Royal Armed Forces, um, working on cultural property protection and cultural emergency response. In that respect, I think the Dutch army is a, a best practice because they set up their own cultural heritage uh, unit and uh, I met them, so I know the wonderful work they do. Uh, but also she is involved in uh, many other initiatives, including one specifically on uh, young people. No? There is one which is called Future is Heritage, is your project, a, a network for youth in cultural heritage. So I would like to ask you, since we are now uh, starting to cover the issue, we are trying to understand what the needs of the communities are. Uh, from your perspective, having worked with young people in cultural heritage, what, what, what is it that the young people need from cultural heritage and in a situation of a disaster, what do you think could be done to consider the specific needs of the youth? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for your question. Um, well, in my capacity as a consultant and project manager, uh, which I do alongside the work uh, in the army, uh, I've been involved with the Futures Heritage uh, since uh, 2018, and as you say, it is a network and platform for young people working in cultural heritage from all over Europe. Uh, not only working, but also studying or volunteering uh, with cultural heritage. 
Um, and we have uh, since then organized uh, different events uh, and meetings in Berlin, in Athens, together with Europa Nostra and in Walre, which is a Dutch city. Um, and during COVID, we are moving uh, a lot of our activities online, also organizing uh, a podcast uh, and, and regular meetups. And during all these events, we have learned a lot about uh, what it means to uh, create and to facilitate meaningful youth engagement, um, which is also the core mission of the Futures Heritage, to, to strengthen the position uh, of these young people in the field. Uh, but also increase engagement, uh, uh, meaningful engagement and increase interest. Um, and the way that we have done this so far is um, not only by stressing uh, and, and by showing what young people are already doing, because there are a lot of uh, people working in heritage, young people working in heritage, doing wonderful projects, uh, doing really innovative things, but also trying to connect uh, the activities of these young people with uh, more experienced cultural heritage professor, uh, professionals, but also to connect them with uh, the wider community. So make the connection with uh, young people who are working in cultural heritage with the general community uh, they are living in. And in my experience, what young people need the most in this is both ownership uh, and agency in what they are doing, uh, being able to share their ideas and their findings uh, and the ability to apply their values, what they find important in these kinds of projects. Um, and at the same time, when you want to connect uh, the activities of these young people with a wider community, you need to find a certain common ground uh, to have a basis uh, to work together upon and create a long-term and sustainable collaboration. Uh, so young people, they need to feel as though the topic that they are working on, uh, that being an archaeological site or that being intangible heritage or monuments, that these locations uh, and the history that is attached to this, that that is also theirs. Um, and this connection uh, was also already mentioned by the past speakers. Uh, this connection is really important. So those are really the lessons that we've learned uh, from the Futurist Heritage, which I think can also apply in a post-disaster situation, uh, that these uh, elements are very important. Thank you so much, Anki. So uh, as you said, we have seen in previous uh, speakers uh, examples that uh, there are technologies that would enable you know, young people to, to sort of become engaged, but uh, you importantly raised the, the issue of agency. So you know, once you have this telephone in your hand, uh, what do you do? Are people listening to you and can you actually change you know, something? Can you make a difference? So, so I think this is a very important lesson that you are bringing up. Thank you so much. Uh, so we move on now to the next uh, speaker who is Mr. Uh, Matteo Pompei. Uh, Mr. Pompei is uh, a geologist uh, by profession, but uh, he also is the mayor of uh, Monte San Martino, uh, a municipality in the Mark region, and I imagine one of those which was affected by the 2016 earthquake. Um, and again, we would like to explore with, uh, with uh, Mr. Pompei his experience of uh, what uh, his community um, went through when the earthquake struck. What did you think were the the needs and the desires of um, of your citizens um, in relation to their cultural identity, the, the, the connections with their cultural heritage. Can you tell us uh, what you have seen, uh, what uh, you remember from those days? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you today. And I hope that we will uh, be able to meet each other in, uh, in person soon provided that uh, COVID-19 uh, situation allow us to do so. I apologize for my English, is my less than perfect English. If something is not clear, uh, please stop me and ask. My career is that of a freelance uh, geologist, but I have also been active in local politics. I became an, an administrator in my municipalities from um, in 12, uh, uh, 2014. And um, now I'm the measure since the 
2019 elections. I experienced them in the 2060 earthquake emergency as a town citizen, as a building designer, and as an administrator, an administrator too. My town, Monte San Martino, was inserted into the area called the Cratere del Sisma, earthquake crater, which has a perimeter that includes uh, 140 towns within four regions. Fortunately for us, Monte San Martino did not suffer any loss of life. However, it received a severe blow to its architectural heritage, as well as to its social and economic fabric. The local economy is based on the tourism, the production of local uh, food product, livestock, or, or um, craftsmanship. The people of this area uh, are, are uh, hard workers, uh, tenacious, and will know for their residents. In a short time, the, the initial situation was stabilized. Our people uh, rolled up their sleeves and began the, to, rebuild, to rebuild the future of this area. With many difficulties, uh, we have forged ahead. In some respect, uh, the earthquake brought positive results here. Our young people who were once rather passive and who wanted to move in the big cities to study, as I did, um, now look to the future of this territory. This is a strong sign of hope for us, for our destiny. Consequently, municipal administrations, associations, and uh, even new commercial activities in our area have seen many young people play active roles in the ideas for the redevelopment. For example, our Prologo, um, which is an association for uh, territorial promotion, now has a young president and a young vice president, both, both females, who are involved in maintaining and promoting our art uh, treasure and the cultural heritage. The 2060 earthquakes changed our way or, of thinking and united our people in a common goal of rebuilding and improving our village. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matteo. This is very promising and, uh, and encouraging. We don't only get bad news from, from you know, those areas that suffered so much. Uh, now I would like to move on to uh, Professor Rocco Zarnic. Um, Professor Zarnic uh, is from the University of Ljubljana. He himself is uh, an engineer who dedicated his life to um, earthquake safe constructions and uh, reconstructions of earthquake damaged building. Um, he has uh, experience uh, at the Slovenian National Institute for Testing Materials and Structures. And uh, he also um, entered into politics because I see that he was also from 2010 to 2012 uh, Minister of the Environment and Special Pla Spatial Planning of the Republic of Slovenia. So, uh, Mr. Zanic, you are a, a technical expert. I mean, so now I'm going to take you a little bit uh, uh, outside of your core area of uh, interest and I would like to ask you from your long experience in emergency response uh, in the aftermath of disaster in your country or the neighboring countries Slovenia, Croatia, um, how did you um, um, understand the uh, needs of the local communities linked to cultural heritage? How were they expressed? Can you tell us a bit about your uh, your experience, and I believe you have some slides that you would like to share with us to show us also what uh, you're talking about. The floor to you, Professor Zanich. Please, you are un you should unmute yourself, Professor Zanich. Yes, yes, I, I noticed. So, Giovanni, thank you very much for such a beautiful introduction. Uh, well, I am engineer, but I also deal with some other problems, especially during my two years, I was responsible also the, for the post-earthquake renovation 
of the Fosotri region, which was under our, uh, our ministry. So uh, what I want to, uh, to tell or to answer to your question is something what is uh, very clear. The behavior, expectation, and the success of any renovation goes through understanding the feelings and the tradition of people living there. But tradition is very much influenced by the historical events. And this area I'm going to talk about today a little bit also later is quite problematic area. So you see, it was the earthquake here in this part of Croatia and in Slovenia in this part. But what I want to say, if you look a little bit back to history, so this area called Banovina or in Serbian language Bania was actually a military frontier zone which Austria populated with the Orthodox faith population in the depopulated area of the, uh, of the Catholic. And they have been actually like a tampon zone fighting against the Turks, which occupied uh, uh, Bosnia uh, in, uh, 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 50, in uh, 16th century, 15th century. And so uh, the, all this uh, situation influenced the cultural heritage but also influence to misunderstanding and fights between all these three nations, especially tragic happened in 1991, 1995 uh, events with et ethnic clashes uh, and many other bad things. But that is also the area of earthquake activity. 1909, was a similar earthquake of magnitude six, like now, and 2020 December was the one which I uh, I want to talk. But what, just to mention, this area is very depopulated and very bad economical situation. Young people are around. Zagreb is one hour north uh, abroad. So I think the main issue, if post-earthquake measures will give something to population, is somehow to create economy and bring people in. What is extremely challenging for Croatian uh, government and the chief of these post-earthquake measures is the vice president, uh, vice prime minister, and Minister of Defense. So how Croatian tried to put it on very strong. But just uh, to go to the, your question, um, three days after earthquake, I went to some, let's say, humanitarian uh, excursion to Croatia. Uh, since I am the president of local rot Rotary Club, uh, also with Lions Club and one association, we went on the 1st of January to this area. And next time I was on the 6th of January and then 16th of January when I got a COVID. But now I am okay. So uh, what I want to say, people need not so much goods. They can survive. They need a warm, warm world. And being an engineer, uh, you are very welcome there because they can explain them. Why it's dangerous to go like this house? Why some house with small cracks is not that dangerous? So in all these three times, I spent each time three or four hours being like a kind of the non-official expert going and helping them to understand. And what, uh, just to finish, uh, is their involvement here. This area has sacral monuments because Christianity is present from the ninth century fortresses from this battle frontier time, uh, medieval and uh, after that, after Turkish occupation 1463 and city centers, which uh, developed in 19th century with the rich economic growth. And uh, damage is very, is very high, about 630 million euro damage to cultural heritage uh, and uh, 
400 million to sacral and 200 million to other. So more about I can tell in the next round. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zarnic. Uh, you uh, introduced a very important issue uh, that uh, was not uh, perhaps uh, highlighted uh, in the previous examples. The, the, the situation of a diverse community with different historical backgrounds and sometimes even conflicting historical narratives. Um, if I may just uh, bring a very quick personal uh, contribution to, to this discussion. As a UNESCO staff, I was involved in uh, the recovery of the cultural heritage affected in Iraq, you know, and uh, I can tell you how difficult it is to plan for the recovery of cultural heritage in an area with so many different ethnic, uh, uh, religious, uh, cultural groups, because this uh, 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 recovery plan, uh, of course, has to take into account their sensitivities, their claims, their um, connections with historical events. And it's absolutely important that you give them the impression that everyone is going to have their share and everyone will be able to, 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 to sort of to gain recognition and to continue to exist through their cultural heritage at the same time. But thank you for this example. We're eager to know more in the following round of questions. So without any further delay, let's go back to Mr. Bernardini because we would like to know um, in, the, in the city of Camerino, Mr. Bernardini, uh, we would like to know more about uh, the uh, role of uh, local associations and local communities. Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, there were 90 of them uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit about how they they contributed to the to the response uh, after the earthquake and were they given a role? In fact, um, did they have an opportunity to to play a role and to be part of the decision making? Can you tell us how the process happened? Allora, sì, sicuramente eh, le associazioni e anche le persone sono state coinvolte moltissimo dalle amministrazioni che si sono succedute dal 2016. Eh, ricollegandomi un po' a quello che diceva il professore prima di me, eh, non è solo nelle zone dove diciamo, ci sono stati dei conflitti, ma anche da noi uno delle, dei primi timori dei piccoli paesi quando diciamo, è arrivato il sisma è che le opere d'arte che venivano prese e portate per essere messe in sicurezza poi non tornassero indietro perché le vedevano proprio come parte del, del proprio uh, storia, del proprio bagaglio culturale eh, tanto che uh, doveva nascere o non nascerà ancora non si sa perché poi non si è più saputo nulla un centro di restauro e conservazione dei beni culturali eh, vicino Camerino in eh, quella che era una vecchia caserma militare e, diciamo, fatta questa prima considerazione sì, è, sono state coinvolte moltissimo le, le associazioni tanto che eh, l'architetto Mario Cucinella proprio a Camerino ha realizzato quello che si chiama workshop di costruzione Camerino un laboratorio di progettazione partecipata eh, in collaborazione con la School of Sustainability eh, proprio per eh, stendere delle linee guida strategiche per quello che è il piano di ricostruzione di Camerino. E questo qua sono stati invitati a partecipare tutte le associazioni e tutti quanti i cittadini. Oltre a questo qui ehm, c'è attualmente, parallelamente, un eh, tavolo di lavoro che coinvolge, oltre al comune, anche la Curia e l'università, perché noi abbiamo una delle università più antiche d'Italia e d'Europa, eh, fondata nel 1336. E questa cosa qui vuoi tradurre? Grazie. Sì. Yes, thank you, Manuel. Yes, you mentioned that um, in your uh, city, Camerino, uh, people were indeed consulted and involved in the, in the planning for uh, recovery immediately after the earthquake and uh, also now in view of the reconstruction. Uh, you mentioned that at uh, the beginning people were afraid that cultural heritage uh, items, uh, precious statues or sacred objects would be uh, taken away from them and never returned. 
Um, there was also a talk of uh, setting up a restoration center near Camerino, but uh, you, you said that this has not been created uh, yet. Uh, but in a nutshell, you uh, explain how uh, the associations uh, were invited to uh, contribute their ideas uh, and to participate in the discussion about uh, the, the future recovery of the city. The, you mentioned a workshop uh, that was created. I suppose this is an ongoing process and also another um, process uh, in which also religious authorities were involved and uh, where also local associations were invited to contribute. So uh, what I'm not clear is whether these are initiatives from the public authorities, the, the last two that I mentioned, the workshop and the, the, the one with the Curia, where, where this uh, sort of uh, formal uh, processes set up by the, the re Regione Marche or by the municipality, or are these initiatives from the bottom up, from the civil society? Can you clarify this point? Sì, in questo caso no, si è trattato diciamo di una cosa che è organizzata da quelli che sono gli enti, quindi eh, dal, dalla nostra amministrazione comunale in primis, e che ha deciso di coinvolgere però le associazioni chiamandole diciamo a esprimere tutte quante le loro opinioni su quella che sarà la Camerino del futuro. Se invece dobbiamo pensare al contrario, quello diciamo, che è venuto dal basso, o una sicuramente esperienza molto positiva è stata quella della creazione della Casa della Musica, eh, a cui ha contribuito l'Andrea Bocelli Foundation. In questo caso invece eh, hanno, hanno risposto, hanno risposto in questo caso con la, questa fondazione a quelle che erano le richieste delle varie associazioni musicali della città che quindi eh, volevano un posto dove poter continuare a suonare dopo che la scuola della musica purtroppo era stata dichiarata inagibile malgrado sia stata realizzata pochi anni prima del, del sisma. E sempre per il discorso di, di come sono state coinvolte tutte quante queste associazioni, eh, in questo momento c'è anche un altro progetto che è stato pensato dall'Unione Europea che si chiama ARC, Advancing Resilience of Historic Areas Against Climate Related and Other Hazards, praticamente che è un progetto che coinvolge Camerino, Bratislava, Hamburgo e Valencia per creare degli strumenti proprio che puntino a, a, ad aiutare le città a salvare quelli che sono eh, tutti quanti il, i beni culturali dagli effetti del, diciamo, dei cambiamenti climatici e yeah. delle emergenze. Grazie Manuel, you're going beyond my capacity to store information. Um, so you mentioned that um, yes, the, the two the, the two processes that you described, the workshop uh, uh, and the other one which you, which you referred to as a tavolo di lavoro, I guess I suppose you know working table, literally, were instigated by the public authorities, by the municipalities. But you also mentioned an important project that came from the civil society, in which was the restoration of the. Casa della Musica, Music House, in cooperation with the Bocelli Foundation, um, to re restore the, this institution where people could uh, play music and, uh, and enjoy music, which was in fact existed before the earthquake, but had been uh, of course damaged by the earthquake. And you finally uh, mentioned a project promoted by the European Commission, uh, which involves Camerino and other cities affected by earthquake uh, called ARC. Um, thank you so much. We perhaps could move on to, um, again, Lucia and Barnaby. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, in retrospect, uh, I mean, uh, now having conducted these projects, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Noi L'Aquila and Lola Aquila and others, where, where you gave people the opportunity to express themselves, to, to express their wishes and desires. Um, and then in, the, in hindsight, do you think that all these ideas, these contributions were actually used by the public authorities? Do you think that uh, this um, willingness uh, 
to, to engage was uh, listened to and people had a chance to, to play a role again in the decision making process. Was anything done to, to, to give a voice to these people and, uh, and, and recovery? I think that the a fundamental thing in L'Aquila is, and I think in many earthquake situations, is that the primary res response by the state was from the top down. And in, in L'Aquila, this is very strongly the case. So from, from the moment of the emergency and the emergency response to the creating of the, the red zone, there was a, a deliberate decision to keep local people out of the process. And over the 10, 11 years now since the earthquake, I think that's something which has been maintained even through changes of government. And um, you mentioned about initiatives that work from the ground up. You know, I think there's an analogy. It, good, this rather, buildings perform well in earthquakes when they have good foundations. And with earthquake response, it's very difficult to create good foundations if you don't actually work from, from the ground upwards. Um, for certain, there was a lot of interest in the projects we were doing. A lot of people who were involved were very stimulated by it. And it definitely had a cultural and psychological impact on all of the people who were involved. But there was absolutely no desire by um, a central government or even uh, local governments to try and integrate any of the citizen initiatives. Thank you. That's not just our ones, but also the other various different initiatives. They were, you know, they made noise, things happened and people were involved, but there was a sensation that it would disturb the, um, the, the flow of money and the, um, the way in which the um, con how things could be controlled. I think it's true to say that information and knowledge is power, and it was very difficult all the way through the reconstruction period, and it is still very difficult now to get information or knowledge about what is happening, what will happen next. And this means that if you have a business, or if you have a business in the city centre you cannot tell whether you you could open your shop and and actually make money out of it because you don't know what's going to happen to the building next to you and this is 10 11 years down the line or two and months later they could close the street for six months as it has happened yeah. in that. so yeah. um unfortunately I, I think that the the ground up initiatives were almost entirely ignored by the top-down process let me say one thing, but um, so in, uh, two years ago, I organized a conference at the University of Languedoc for the 10 years of the earthquake. And one um, very painful point in L'Aquila was that in 2009, uh, 2019, still no school had been reconstructed in the town. And the children were still in temporary buildings with a lot of problems, holes, um, and that were not structures that were right to have a school for such a long time because there were no gyms, no art labs, no science labs and so on. So um, the reason for me to organize this conference was to, uh, to bring forward this issue of the schools, of the safety of schools in Laguna. And so I organized a round table. I organized uh, um, for the conference participants and some specialists from UCL to come and talk. And I invited the local municipalities, so the mayor and the president of the province and the president and the guy who um, looks after schools in the comune and uh, the person responsible for the reconstruction. And to my surprise, that was the first time they had ever met around one table all together. So these people, four main people, all responsible for re the reconstruction of schools in L'Aquila because elementary schools are um, the uh, prerogative of the comune and um, school media and superiori of the provincia. And then Ustra had to say when and how they could be rebuilt. And they had never met together because they were from two political, different political parties. So they had never spoken. So that was a very heated discussion 
but it definitely started a conversation because then I um, and I called the representative of the um, uh, students and the local communities representatives and there was a lot of anger that came out from the local communities telling these people you've ignored us for 10 years our kids are going to the schools that are not safe um, and that started a real conversation and now the schools are being are starting to be rebuilt but um, it was I mean this is about the schools and of course it's uh, crucial but uh, did you have the impression that there was some fundamental issue that uh, was expressed by the community? Yes, that nobody listens to them. Nobody has ever involved them. Nobody has asked them, what do you need? What are your priorities? What do you need to feel safe and happy and to return to live in this town? So well, I think this goes, this goes into the, the bigger question of how, how um, citizen participation can change approaches to the response. Because I think the, the, the critical thing really is that you know, failing to engage the community of a city in thinking about its future is, I think it's a, it's a huge mistake. And if, if, um, if there'd been active consultation and meaningful consultation processes through the reconstruction, it would have allowed the reconstruction to proceed in a more organized manner and in a way that people could actually benefit from and I, I think it would have made maybe a four or five year difference to the time period within which Laquita can start to be active again as a as a tourist destination as a cultural destination and you know now the city centre is starting to have a lot of reconstructed and, and beautiful buildings but it's unable to capitalize on that obviously the Covid pandemic superimposes on top of this but um, you know the the problem of not being able to plan ahead for ordinary citizens is a it's a major deal right? and it impacts on the economy and it particularly impacts on the cultural economy. Thank you, Barnaby and Lucia, for shedding light on, on these important issues. Uh, I suppose I've been to L'Aquila recently. I've seen all these new building reconstructed and looking shiny and uh, new, and. Uh, Indeed, there is a risk of uh, a gentrification process where the old sort of community is replaced by a new <laughs> population, but, uh, but we are not there yet. It would be maybe important for you at some point to, to, to write a report on what happened. Uh, now let's move on to Enki, because I would like to ask her to tell us about her other uh, sort of background, the, the, the military one. Uh, you spoke about the, the youth project that you're in charge of, but now I'd like to hear from you about uh, your experience as an officer within the army. And um, what do you think in a post-disaster situation the military forces could do in, in cooperation with communities to, um, to support cultural heritage conservation? Is there any experience that you can share with us? Any Anything you might be able to say about what the, the Dutch army does to engage with communities in responding to a disaster? Thank you. You're the floor. Yes, thank you. Well, um, it might be good, uh, first of all, to stress uh, that I'm expressing my views from a Dutch perspective. So with knowledge of the Dutch military and its relation to uh, communities, and I don't know uh, different countries, of course, have different relations uh, with their military. Um, but I can uh, give a little bit of uh, context about the department where I work, uh, which is the Civil Military Cooperation Command, also known as CIMIC, uh, which consists out of people who have an expertise in the civil society, such as um, legal experts or psychologists, but also art historians and archaeologists. Uh, and my section is called uh, the Section of Cultural Affairs and Information and was modeled after uh, the American Monuments Men. Uh, maybe this is a reference that uh, some of you knew. Um, so now, of course, in time, uh, our work and the context of our work has changed, uh, but the basis is still the same, which is the 1945 Hague Convention by UNESCO on uh, the protection of cultural property in times of uh, crisis. 
Uh, and what we do in the Netherlands is at the moment we are focusing on creating a new Dutch military manual for cultural property protection and cultural emergency response and to organize training exercises to improve our practice, uh, not only within our section, uh, but within the whole military. Um, because one of the things uh, that, that we definitely need more in the military is awareness on the importance of cultural property protection and cultural emergency response. And also one of the essential points in this manual is uh, the point that the military uh, in these kinds of situation is not the expert on cultural heritage and is not the expert on what is important to save or preserve. Uh, but local communities uh, are these experts and local institutions and local authorities. Uh, and our role as CIMIC officers is then to form uh, the bridge between these local institutions and communities and the military personnel uh, that is present uh, to provide aid for the situations. Um, and of course, in practice, this cooperation is, is heavily influenced by the priorities uh, of the military. And when you don't have any awareness of the importance of cultural heritage uh, within the military, uh, then the post-disaster response won't take this into account uh, as much as they need to. Uh, so one of the essential aims for this manual and, and for the activities of our section is to get cultural heritage to be a core part uh, of the disaster response and to be able to, uh, for starters, facilitate uh, this collaboration between local communities and between uh, the military that is providing first aid. And um, I must be honest here that we haven't ha really had that many examples that could count for success stories uh, on cultural first aid. Uh, also not in the Dutch military. Um, one of the latest humanitarian disasters uh, where the Dutch military was deployed uh, to provide first aid uh, were the hurricanes in nine, uh, 2017 in the Caribbean. Uh, St. Martin, uh, the island was one of the locations. And one of the problems that uh, in hindsight, uh, we can uh, mention that we encountered there is that uh, there were no good connections uh, between uh, the, the, well, the people that who were coordinating this first aid and uh, the people uh, like me who function as cultural heritage experts uh, there. So in hindsight, we can say we could have done a lot more to provide cultural first aid uh, in the Caribbean. And this is something um, that we weren't able to do back then. Uh, so with this military manual and uh, with training exercises, we hope to be able to create more general awareness within the army uh, to be able to uh, provide this first aid better and to be able to better collaborate with local communities. Thank you, Anki. <clears throat> the Hague Convention of UNESCO, the 1954, has a very narrow definition of uh, cultural property. You know, it's just the monuments, the objects, and uh, it also has a, a limited scope in that basically militaries are supposed not to uh, target these cultural properties and you know, to, to stay away from them. Um, but uh, when people are involved, we see that there is a lot more that could be done or should be done, including, for example, maintaining access to cultural heritage sites, which are important, you know, uh, enabling uh, the continuity of cultural practices. So as a UNESCO staff, I also worked a lot to broaden this uh, perspective. And uh, in that respect, we had interesting experiences with the peacekeeping um, operations in Mali, or even the response to the Haiti earthquake, where we work with the, the blue helmets of the UN and, and other you know, armies from different countries. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Enki. Um, we would like now to move to um, Mr. Pompei, uh, Matteo. Um, as a mayor, um, you were, uh, I think, uh, on the side of the authorities when the earthquake struck. So. Uh, now, since this second question is about the role of communities, I would like to ask you to tell us if you felt that um, such a role was indeed given to local communities in, in your experience, in your case, and uh, how did you 
uh, set up a process where they could contribute, they could participate in the decision-making process. In uh, 1216, uh, I wasn't a measure, I was councillor in the municipality, but was the same, was the same. I work uh, anyway for uh, earthquake uh, resolution problems. So uh, immediately after the earthquake, uh, those who lost their homes were accommodated in local facilities where they received the bedrooms and daily hot meals. Moreover, they received the, the comra camaraderie of their friends who, was, who were often housed in the same facility. Uh, our community is small, but when we have problem, we are a big family, then we help each other. Uh, this group of support created the tranquility in their life, uh, lives, uh, which was much needed. After this phase, our goal was to bring people back to Monte San Martino, to my village, from the bed and breakfast where they were housed. This was very important for us in order to save our town uh, from a slow uh, abandonment. Luckily, there were some unoccupied uh, homes in the historical center of our village, which uh, we were able um, to use as housing for those awaiting for the reconstruction of their homes. This has given life to the town and um, has enabled us to involve the people in our local festival or to renew our concert heritage, our uh, all the activities in the center. Thus, we this kind uh, of, uh, I mean, thus with, with, with this kind of management of the situation, the citizens of Monte San Martino have returned and they've increasingly played an active role for uh, in the life of our uh, community. Unlike the situation of many other uh, area towns where uh, who saw uh, their citizen flee to the coastal town or other areas. Then we work a lot to let the people stay in our town and um, with good presence, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. We, we conclude the second round with the uh, Professor Zarnic, uh, to whom I would like to ask him to tell us about his experience in the last earthquake in Croatia, um, which happened during the uh, pandemic's emergency. So uh, can you share with us uh, your, uh, your experience and uh, particularly tell us um, if you felt that um, local communities and uh, civil associations had uh, a role to play in uh, taking decisions uh, in this uh, context. Professor, you're the floor. Maybe you should unmute yourself, Professor. Okay, now it's okay. Uh, well, um, talking about the two disasters in same time, the COVID and earthquake, it is what I experienced there, very strange situation. People were so afraid of earthquake that they forgot to COVID. And I was actually behaving like them. So that's why I harvested COVID on 16 there. So fortunately, uh, I didn't suffer that much, so I'm okay. But uh, just to say, uh, it's very interesting reaction of people. What is the priority? When I ask people why you don't wear masks, well, everybody has COVID already, it's nothing. We are afraid of chimney falling down. We are afraid what our children will eat. So that is which fear, which danger is much higher. I think that um, COVID is the long-term higher problem than reconstruction. Well, uh, here on a few slides, I'm not going to go through this, but I, I collected some, some figures about the amount. It's a tremendous uh, 
amount of disaster. Let's say in Croatia, one half billion euro is estimated, estimated uh, damages and one billion of this of cultural heritage. And cultural heritage is something what is rare what they have there. So as I said, they are very depopulated. The economy is completely down. There are old people living there. And heritage can be in future driver of the, of the, of the progress. But most of these heritage are sacral. So it's more for soul than for bread. Uh, so it, it, it will be a, a tremendous challenge for Croatian government to manage this issue because it's not only the material issue, but it's also this what I'm talking. But also what is the understanding of people? Uh, after earthquake, um, many masonry buildings, which were not properly done, even newer collapsed. The masonry buildings which are properly done didn't collapse. But this area has a rich timber structure heritage. So here you see on the left uh, is the one uh, house from the mid 19th century. It is located in village Strashnik, which is one kilometer south of epicenter. On the right side is abandoned because the owner um, uh, emigrated from Croatia in 1995. But this building without maintenance is fantastically survived earthquake. So people are now talking, never go anymore in masonry. I want to have a timber structure. That's why the modern timber structure construction is now very much in focus of post earthquake renovation, especially because of the feeling of safety, security in such a building. So from this, we can see how the, let's say, European nowadays trend is a green economy, uh, green building, uh, uh, um, environment efficient building, that is all the timber. But the problem is because the industry collapsed down, all people are living there, and I don't know, I'm not sure, and later on the third uh, answer, I will give you a little bit more my position. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You broke up a very important issue, the issue of uh, the traditional knowledge of uh, local communities, which is uh, accumulated over centuries of uh, experience of disasters. And so it is uh, sort of uh, intrinsically uh, disaster prone and disaster sort of safe in a sense. Um, thank you so much. Um, now um, we have gone over the six speakers of this round table uh, for two sets of questions. Uh, it's been now more than an hour. I am looking at Mr. Isini to know how much time we have left to, to continue this very interesting uh, conversation. If you can tell me please more or less uh, what's our time schedule. Okay, uh, we can go on uh, still for uh, until uh, 5 p.m. So we could uh, ask our uh, speakers to answer uh, as quick as possible the third uh, uh, turn of questions. And then we allow time for the questions from the attendees. Thank you so much. So exactly what I imagined, because we have taken our time during the first two questions, but we would like to give some time for others to, to come in. In the meantime, I've seen an interesting uh, stream of questions related to Enki's uh, first uh, intervention on the chat. Um, so let's move quickly to uh, Mr. Bernardini, um, who in a sense has already addressed my third question because I wanted to ask him uh, uh, basically uh, which kind of activities uh, uh, are you carrying out as a, as a representative of uh, an association um, to contribute to shaping the reconstruction process, the long-term reconstruction process? Uh, can you give us a very quick answer to that, explaining maybe the key points? Mr. Bernardini, you have the floor. 
Sì, allora cercherò di essere velocissimo. Eh, il fatto che eh, questi terremoti, queste tragedie poi rimangono nella tradizione dei posti si vede benissimo a Camerino, il cui stemma sono tre case che leggenda vuole siano le uniche tre case rimaste in piedi dopo un terremoto. E per quanto riguarda invece quali sono le attività che sto portando e che stiamo portando insieme con tutte quante le associazioni avanti per la parte di costruzione, eh, stiamo portando avanti soprattutto un discorso di ricostruzione, sensibilizzazione e valorizzazione di ciò che era la nostra storia, perché attualmente la maggior parte degli abitanti si trovano all'interno delle SAE, che sono diciamo, delle situazioni eh, d'emergenza abitative, quindi delle casette di legno, come potremmo dire. Eh, come con il non crollo abbiamo pensato all'associazione, quindi a un posto dove vivere questa attività, con le, altre con le altre attività, con le altre associazioni stiamo portando avanti dei progetti simili, in particolare quali? Con il Trova Storia della Marca stiamo riscoprendo tutte quelle che sono le fortificazioni dei Davarano medievali e... che sono nella nostra zona, quindi non solo a Camerino ma in tutto quanto il territorio. Eh, poi l'abitare in queste case che non appartengono a quella che è la nostra cultura perché sono ovviamente delle case che ricordano un po' villaggi turistici e uno le nota subito quando arriva ci ha portato a voler cercare ancora di più di preservare quella che è la nostra storia. Quindi con il club per l'UNESCO e Torrentino e Terre Maceratesi stiamo portando avanti una candidatura di tutta quanta diciamo, l'area del sisma, per intenderci, della provincia di Macerata come biosfera UNESCO, nel progetto Man and Biosphere dell'UNESCO. In più stiamo portando avanti altri progetti eh, paralleli, in particolare Rocca Varano, abbiamo partecipato al progetto FAI Luoghi del Cuore e stiamo cercando di trovare dei finanziamenti per ristrutturarla. Abbiamo organizzato degli eventi eh, fuori dalla Rocca perché purtroppo è inagibile dopo il 2016 eh, proprio per sensibilizzare e per tornare a vivere quello che è uno dei simboli di tutto il territorio non solo di Camerino. Eh. Grazie, thank you so much uh, Mr. Bernardini. So briefly you mentioned that uh, um, the, the Camerino's municipality has in its symbol three houses, which uh, according to the legend, the three only extant houses after a, an important earthquake that happened in the past, uh, which is a demonstration of the fact that at, at the heart of the city identity is this uh, response to, to an earthquake. You, you said that the focus for the associations is uh, on uh, promoting uh, the reconstruction of your history. Um, you, you said that uh, inhabitants at uh, the moment are forced to live in uh, temporary accommodation, temporary structures, prefab uh, you know, houses, which are not uh, sort of uh, in conformity with the, your traditional way of uh, uh, settling, of inhabiting, and that uh, Um, you are <clears throat> trying to uh, address this issue through a number of initiatives. You mentioned the project called Trova Storie Marca, which is focused on the recovery of uh, um, many military fortifications in your region. You said that with your UNESCO club, you are promoting uh, the nomination of the area affected by the earthquake as a UNESCO man and the biosphere. Um, reserve. And then uh, finally, you mentioned the Rocca Varano project. Uh, this is, I suppose, um, some sort of, again, fortification that you're trying to restore and fundraise uh, for. So a number of very important initiatives to reconnect, uh, you know, with, the, with your territory and its history. Now, uh, let's again move on to Lucia and Barnaby. Um, i was going to ask you what, uh, what are your feelings about the status of the <clears throat> physical reconstruction, but also of the psychological uh, you know, situation of the community you know, over 10 years after the earthquake. You already kind of responded in your previous uh, intervention. Um, perhaps uh, you could uh, share with us your ideas about how communities could be more engaged from now on. What do you think should be done to, to remedy this issue? 
So yes, I um, I said some of the points um, about that. I've been thinking two things. So on the physical, there is a lot has been done in L'Aquila and um, one mustn't underestimate the importance of the physical reconstruction because for an example, when the church of Colemaggio was rebuilt, that first Christmas mass all together in Colemaggio, uh, which was two years ago, was incredibly emotional. And um, everybody felt that we had got back together as a community. And also last summer concerts that were done in the center uh, made people feel like we were a community again. On the other hand, um, the fact that there is no communication continues to give the impression that there is no plan. We don't know where we're going. Uh, we don't know what the future brings, that this town is, is struggling to get back together. Um, and therefore, and things like, for an example, the, the market, which used to be in the main square is now outside the town. So that means that people go outside the town during the day to buy their vegetables and so on. Um, so, Things like that, the, as the previous speaker was saying, rediscovering the local traditions are incredibly important. Uh, I was saying at the beginning, I've been thinking about what really means to rebuild after a disaster, also after COVID. And so we started this project, as you know, called the Invisible Reconstruction. We are producing a book. We will be doing a conference in September with the Rizumikan Institute of Disaster Mitigation and Cultural Heritage. Um, because we want to promote this, um, this concept that reconstruction is not just the reconstruction of buildings. The most difficult part is the psychological reconstruction of the people. What do we need to do to give people this possibility to regain their well-being after a disaster? And all these things uh, are very important. The rediscovery of tradition, culinary um, rediscovery, reconnecting to your cultural heritage in, in some way with activism, um, but, but also providing safe education and giving a voice to the people. And art and heritage have got a, a great importance in all of that. I'm trying to be very brief. <laughs> I just wanted to quickly add, I mean, when we first started the project, one of the motivators for it was going into the center of L'Aquila, which, you know, I'm, I'm English, so my first visit to L'Aquila, it was a shock to how loud everything was, how many, how many people there were all the time. And then, you know, I found myself in the center of L'Aquila at the end of 2009, and it was just me and one guy dragging a piece of steel down the road. And I thought, where's the city? And we had the strong sensation where we just realized that you know, a city without people isn't a city at all. And so everything we did, has, everything we've done has been about bringing people back to the physical city. And um, you know, I think that's gen generally what is needed post-disaster. And beyond that, I suppose the thing we're really interested in is how you get people to engage with their cultural her heritage before disaster, because you know disasters happen, and so you know we've lived the experience of L'Aquila, and hopefully in our lifetimes that won't happen again. But it's these are situations which repeat themselves periodically and which repeat themselves globally. And um, you know, an ambition is to try and in, and learn from what we've been through to try and help other communities become more resilient and and more connected to their heritage in the longer term. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lucia and Barnaby. I've been to L'Aquila, as I said, and I've seen that uh, lots has been done. And also with the subsidies from the government, you know, some friends of mine, for example, whose house had been damaged, uh, were able to restore it thanks to contributions from the state. And I thought that that was uh, quite uh, significant. I mean, you don't see this everywhere. Um, I'd like to now move on to Enki for a final question to her. Uh, and I'd like to refer to her experience in another uh, educational project that she's been involved in, which is called the Week of the Vacant Building, where 
basically students are engaged into re redevelopment of vacant that is empty buildings um, and then they they cooperate with the i guess authorities to to make proposals about what could be done to adaptively reuse these buildings and uh, so now we are talking about recovery and i wanted to ask her if she felt that this uh, project and the experience she gathered through this project could um, bring any lessons that could be useful for example in a post disaster situation could the young people be asked to uh, engage on specific projects to uh, restore and reuse uh, buildings, for example. Please, thank you. Yes, well, so the week of the vacant building is essentially, uh, as you rightly say, an educational program uh, that is a simulation. Uh, so we're um, in a vacant building, a real life vacant, vacant building. It, it is a simulation of interdisciplinary work. Uh, to redevelop and redesign this building where students get a taste of how uh, such a process would be uh, if it were in, in, in real life, if they were working as heritage professionals. And I think these kinds of projects are very valuable because it enables you to prepare for a situation that you don't know. And, and it enables you to learn skills that are relevant in such a setting. And I think it was mentioned before uh, by one of the other participants that one of the problems is uh, in, in uh, a disaster situation and post-disaster recovery that people are never fully prepared. Uh, and of course, it is a question uh, whether you can really be fully prepared. Uh, but to do simulations is one of the methods that can prepare you better. And this is also uh, a thing that we do in the military. We do simulations with actors in order to uh, better our practice. Um, so a simulation of a disaster situation, but also, for example, a situation of a reconstruction uh, you can use to engage people in imagining a new future and, and engage students basically in uh, dreaming out loud, uh, so to say, and at the same time involving different people in the whole process of reconstruction. Um, so well, this year with this project, we are of course limited by, by COVID and we are not able to do uh, the week of the vacant building, which is why in January we started uh, a new process of redesigning the week of the vacant building into a game, uh, a digital game that we can play in a day. So it is still a simulation of working together on uh, a reconstruction uh, and it's still about heritage development, but then more easily organizable and condensed and accessible online. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that we can uh, can do with such a project, with a simulation uh, that, that can make, uh, well, that can improve a post-disaster reconstruction uh, phase. And well, I hope maybe if we are able to meet up in person eventually that I can uh, present to you the digital game that we have uh, and, and, and show you what can be the added value of this kind of thing. Thank you, Anki. Yes, uh, we also worked on uh, something similar at UNESCO with our partner at the Kyoto University. We called it Disaster Imagination Game, DIG, and uh, it gave wonderful results. Um, yes, I wish we had done some simulations for the pandemics, for example. It was quite discouraging to realize that nobody had masks, that we had no idea what to do, you know, although everyone knew that this would be coming. A uh, very important point. Uh, let's move on to Matteo for a last question. But again, you have already told us basically what your vision is for recovery. Um, and reconstruction. Uh, can you please maybe share with us um, a few additional words on uh, how do you think uh, this uh, reconstruction process in your, in your area, in your, in your town, but also your feeling in general for the region of Marke um, will take into consideration the, the, the wishes, the, the, the needs expressed by uh, the community. I mean, we have already seen that cultural heritage, monuments, churches, um, main museums are more or less taken care of by the authorities in Italy. Is there anything else that you think should be done to 
get on board the, the needs of the communities and that you would like to share with us? I can talk uh, about my community in particular. Uh, also in the, the community of the region. I mean, you are a citizen of the Marque region. I wasn't, ready. I wasn't ready for this question. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, by the way, um, Marque region is full of uh, cultural heritage, principally even our area where um, earthquake struck, we have many, many art treasures because uh, in the past, in medieval age, this area was the richer area because it was, um, was easy to defend. Then even uh, little villages like mine, like Monte San Martino, have many, many art treasures. And uh, we had ex um, we had uh, earthquake stroke strong here, but we was lucky because um, the historical center of our village is located on uh, the top of uh, an hill, whose foundation is solid rock. Then, uh, um, as a consequence, uh, our medieval structure was uh, as as remained almost intact and some public buildings suffered damage and many homes as well uh, as businesses uh, were damaged or destroyed. Luckily, our art trees remained unscathed. Our village is really small, but it's famous, famous for uh, its art heritage, as I said. Um, in our beautiful church and the historic building, we guard, we guard masterpieces of art, which are the envy of great Italian cultural center. Then our economy is, of course, tourism, but artistic tourism. Then we, it's a goal for us to promote this territory. For sure, Marche area still is not so famous like, uh, I don't know, Tuscany or uh, other regions, but we, ha we have uh, everything to be a famous region for art, for uh, cultural. Still, still, I think we are one region that is really original Italian. It's not like influenced from uh, mass tourism. And uh, I love this of this region. But we have to work a lot. We have to, to have uh, young people who take the future of this uh, territory. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Think carefully because before turning Le Marche into a mass tourist destination, we, we, don't, we want it to stay as it is. <laughs> I don't want mass tourism, but uh, slow tourism here. People who like uh, our qualities. We don't need mass tourism, even because we are not ready for mass tourism, I guess. Great. Wonderful. I, I wish I can visit you in your village soon. Um, um, so let's conclude uh, by again turning to Professor Zarnic, Rocco, um, with the final question to you on uh, the overall approach to the reconstruction process uh, in your um, ideas and how local communities may be actively involved. Um, is there anything that you could see from your experience uh, that uh, gives us some good ideas? How would you do it? You have to unmute yourself, Professor Zanich. I always forget. Uh, well, uh, talking about the post-earthquake approach, I mean uh, that here, what experiences shows in Slovenia and now in Croatia, it's very important how fast the state authorities react with legislation. So, uh, for instance, uh, the Posoči region in Slovenia was hit by earthquake on April 12, 1998. On May 25, the law was issued. And be careful. It was the law for post-earthquake reconstruction of buildings and promotion of development in the region. So, uh, being earthquake engineer, uh, sometimes we say between us, moderate earthquakes are 
big drivers of economic and social growth. Don't misunderstand me. But that is uh, occasion for mobilizing uh, so politicians, local communities, people, and funds to make progress of region. So uh, our law uh, brought the form organization period criteria for permanent recovery, methodology of calculating state financial aid, and also strengthening of regional economy. This law was mostly oriented to economy, but it also has a technical part in what is the business as usual, more or less. We have very, very good European codes in Europe. So we know, we learned the last 50 years how to build efficient new buildings. We also learned how efficiently repair. But you know, it's not only the building, as somebody said before, it's much more about the society. In this case, I am a bit disappointed by the law which Croatia issued on May, on February, although the Zagreb was hit by earthquake more than almost a year ago. So uh, in our case, it was very strong political consensus between all parties uh, to forget political whatever competition, we have to solve the problem. It's not very likely now in Croatia. So they concentrated very much on the technical part. And just to give you a little bit uh, what we did in uh, Sposoce, um, I was uh, a little bit involved by the uh, work in this because I was working that time in the National Institute for Earthquake Engineering, uh, for Civil Engineering which was the main actor and main technical support to government. So uh, in this Lex Specialis from May 25, the establishing of the state technical office, which started in May 26, was inside. Uh, the new spatial and applicable spatial implementation acts were checked. Simplified administrative proce procedures were put in power. Rules and price list for execution of renovation works. So we controlled, we controlled the market and quality. And this uh, state, uh, state uh, uh, office was the one who signed every, very, uh, every uh, intervention. Uh, so to protect people, inhabitants and economy from overcharging. Uh, so uh, it was also self-constructing for thin. So it was very, very much oriented to the public needs. And in Croatia, uh, they are now trying to do the best. I, 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 I hope it's very early to give any, any conclusion. But regarding this, what you said, what is the activity of people after earthquake? It may be dangerous. Here's one case of the Zhajina church in 1788, which before earthquake was not in best condition. During the first earthquake, 5-2 magnitude, in December 28, a day before the strong one, a group of citizens, uh, together with organists, tried to do something, to save something. When they've been in church, new earthquake came, the organist who was trying to protect organ was killed, and two other badly uh, injured. So I was the one, oh, I, I shouldn't do that, but I, I went in to take a picture, hoping no earthquake will, be, uh, will happen when I was there. But uh, it is a set. And there's another issue here uh, of the historical, but now I think we have no more time for this case study and I, I may, I may, I may uh, finish here. Thank you so much, uh, Rocco, again, for all this um, wonderful uh, images and information that you share with us from your rich experience. Um, we have come to the end of our round table. I think we are within the time that was allotted to us. I think it's been very interesting. We um, addressed uh, the three questions that were put to us by Ms. Trot at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, that is the needs 
of communities in a post-disaster situation, the possible role that they might play in a response phase, so immediately after the, the disaster. And finally, the involvement uh, of communities in a longer term recovery and reconstruction processes. Um, I would like maybe to summarize with the raising three points that seemed important to me that emerged from this uh, conversation. The first is that um, the definition of what is cultural heritage, um, if we take uh, communities in, into the equation, uh, becomes slightly different from the traditional one. It's not just uh, the, the great monuments and works of art, but there is a, a smaller kind of heritage, uh, you know, associations with events, um, memories, uh, uh, places that have a meaning uh, for local communities, which is equally important and that has to be taken on board in uh, response and recovery. Um, in fact, this is the second point that I would like to, to make. Um, I think what we have seen when communities are involved is that it's not just about uh, things, physical uh, you know, assets, well, we heard how important it was to go back to the Basilica of Colle Maggio in L'Aquila on Christmas Eve. Uh, and that, uh, of course, the restoration of the cathedral was important, but um, it's also about uh, things that people do, where they go, um, and their associations to, to places that, uh, that has to be um, given consideration, which um, also was brought to light by the risk of uh, gentrification, the, the, the risk of creating empty shells, you know, of beautifully restored uh, historic centers for tourists which have no people around. And, uh, and finally, we have uh, heard about the challenge of uh, ensuring that communities are involved, consulted in these processes and the need to have ways of doing this um, built into the system, not just um, improvised after the event, but uh, given consideration uh, even in normal times, in peace times. Uh, there will be many more things to say. I would like to stop here. I see that there are some questions asked in the chat. I'm giving the floor back to Giovanni Sini, perhaps to take it from here and uh, how I should proceed. Yes, so thanks a lot for the for this round table and uh, move straight to the questions from your side. So you have any question or comment about the, um, the points we have investigated today are welcome. Um, so let's go. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. But I would like to. I would like uh, to um, ask. I would like to address a question to Matteo. Just one moment. Excuse me, Matteo Bernardi, uh, Manuel Bernardini. I'm sorry, and uh, Lucia Patrizio Gianni. Can you introduce? Because we have on Facebook a question. We have a face on uh, a question on Facebook by Rossella Rombardo that tells us, good afternoon, everybody. I have a question for you. I'm wondering I'm afraid we, we lost the communication. Yes. Complete perspective. That makes them feel part of the project. Sorry, Blandina, we I cannot... Uh, Blandina, we cannot hear you very well. So if you don't mind, uh, I will try to read the questions. The question uh, we received uh, in uh, Facebook in your place. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, in a more concrete uh, perspective, what could be an audience development, development strategy and activity involving uh, local young people to, to that makes them feel part of the project? 
So as uh, Blandina said, uh, this question uh, would be addressed to Manuel Bernardini and uh, Lucia Patrizio Gunning. Um, thank you for this. I think Barnaby should come into this answer yes, too. Yes, for sure. Because, um, because he's a real catalyst of young people through information technologies. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, uh, projects like take a picture of, of your town, upload it on a website, um, uh, learn what the history of something that you didn't know before is. So as I said before in L'Aquila, a lot of kids um, didn't know the town, didn't know the building in towns, don't know the name of the streets. So they need to be reconnected to, to the town, to its monuments, to the places, to their meaning for um, other people in town, for their parents even. When we uh, did the engagement project, it's now about six years ago, we were working with secondary school students who were in Una Scuola delle Belle Arti, I think it was. And they, essentially, they, when the earthquake happened, they'd been very young, they'd been kind of kindergarten age um, or primary school age. And so they, whenever they'd been in town, it had been with their families and we spent two days um, going with them into the city center and we decided to kind of adopt a street as the place to work and spend those two days. Each person took a building and took about a hundred photographs. And then we uploaded those and used the images to create automatic 3D models. And they were immediately fascinated partly by the process, but also it gave them the chance independently to uh, connect with a physical part of the city. And I saw that they responded really well to that. One thing we wanted to do was to uh, try and find a, um, a, method a methodology to connect a, a class of students with a specific place in the town so that then they could do you know, a one or two day workshop going, photographing, modeling, drawing, um, the place in order to get more connected to it, but also to try and get them to engage with um, the people who are actually involved in the reconstruction. So uh, if, this is not something we've done, it's something we wanted to do, but never found the time or the resources to do it. But it, it, it occurred to me as an architect, I can see during the reconstruction process, every building has a package of information about its history, you know, when it was built, what the historical background to it is. And uh, often that co covers a lot of information which then stays concealed because it's just part of a building submission. And we thought it would be really interesting to, to see if it's possible to get school kids to communicate with the engineers and architects, to ask them questions about the buildings and then to create a kind of um, online dossier that stays you know, geolocated and um, could be something that other people could look at. So these kind of projects were things we thought were interesting. And as I said, the, the 3D scanning project definitely had a great deal of engagement from the students. Perhaps we could hear now from, I think, Manuel. Uh, no, yes, Manuel, I think the question was addressed to him as well, no? Yes. Allora, noi eh, per cercare di coinvolgere i giovani, ma soprattutto i più giovani, perché poi è quella la fascia che secondo me è più difficile da coinvolgere in questi progetti, eh, abbiamo fatto delle collaborazioni con le scuole di Camerino, oh, faccio l'esempio di Rocca Varano, perché tutti quanti i ragazzi sono stati coinvolti nella raccolta di questi voti per il progetto, non solo nella parte finale, perché sarebbe stato un po', eh, passatemi il termine, squallido, eh, sono stati coinvolti già da prima, cioè è stata prima spiegata la storia di questa rocca, la storia quindi del nostro territorio, la, nostra, la storia dei nostri luoghi, cercando di ovviamente mescolarla anche con un po' di leggende, di fantastico, e poi una volta fatto questo loro hanno cominciato a scrivere storie su Rocca Varano, hanno cominciato a fare disegni su Rocca Varano, quindi si sono sentiti partecipi di quella che era il loro modo di vedere Rocca Varano, sono stati coinvolti anche negli eventi 
eventi che abbiamo fatto su. Quindi ecco, secondo me bisogna ripartire proprio dalle basi, cioè eh, far tornare le persone a capire che una rocca, un, eh, un monumento, una qualsiasi cosa è parte della nostra storia anche eh, se la vediamo magari molto distante e molto lontana. Thank you, Manuel. So you, you explained how you <coughs> went about um, involving uh, young people, including very young people, uh, in the post-earthquake uh, uh, scenario situation. You mentioned that you initiated a number of um, collaborative projects with schools, and you, you referred to the example of the Rocca Varano projects where students were first told about the importance of this uh, place and then uh, <clears throat> encouraged to, uh, to, for example, produce uh, art, I guess, drawings or uh, storytelling about this place. And you uh, underline how important it is to, to reestablish this connection between people, young people, and, and, and the cultural heritage of, the, of their areas. So that's, uh, of course, uh, but involvement with schools is a key instrument to, to do this and I take this opportunity to also <clears throat> recall a project in which we were involved in Indonesia after the tsunami of 2004. We did a bit of the same thing. We asked people to, uh, young students to, to draw, you know, uh, their, their cities and town and, and, and it was a, a process of psychological healing. Uh, some of the drawings were quite disturbing because these people had seen actually, you know, <clears throat> the tsunami uh, devastating the, the, the city and their areas, but I think uh, the results were quite uh, important. Thank you so much. Um, are there other questions that were posted on web, on Facebook or the chat? I see a long list of uh, exchanges on the chat. I don't know if there is a specific questions to be asked to, to anyone. Giovanni, I'm asking you to guide me here. Yes, I think our staff uh, will uh, transfer the question on the chat also live. So I don't know, Marta, let's, uh, let's go. Yes, we have um, an, a question for uh, Mrs. Peterson and uh, you already uh, answered in the chat, but maybe you could share the, the answer with the whole audience. Um, the, the question here is, uh, how do you evaluate the engagement of youth with cultural heritage in your country? And do they consider that Dutch heritage buildings can be somehow at danger? Um, so, well, the, while there's, of course, always uh, room for improvement, I think the situation with uh, youth engagement in the Netherlands is uh, going the right way. Um, the Netherlands is for the past three years, I think, uh, focusing a lot on the FARO Convention, uh, the FARO Convention on Community Participation in Cultural Heritage, and therefore stimulating organizations and authorities like municipalities to uh, really uh, try to uh, facilitate uh, participation and engagement in cultural heritage processes. And this is an intangible heritage uh, project, but also uh, involvement in monument redevelopment and so on. And a few of the examples that I can mention in this engagement for youth is uh, that several um, regional heritage organizations uh, have so-called youth boards. So they really uh, create these uh, boards of young people that are part of the organization that get funding to do projects. Um, so this is one example. Another example is um, um, uh, prizes for cultural heritage, especially for youth uh, and youth networks uh, for cultural heritage. Uh, so these are the kind of things that are happening in the Netherlands uh, that really try to promote uh, youth engagement. Uh, but of course, there's always a lot more uh, to be done. Um, and when it comes to cultural heritage involvement in the protection of buildings, uh, I think uh, this is something that can, uh, can still be improved. But the first step is youth boards uh, and, and, and youth networks uh, is a good step. I see a hand raised from Matteo Piscicelli. 
Perhaps you want to step in, Matteo? Uh, hi, everyone. Do you hear me? Uh, okay, I'm, I would like to ask something uh, to our moderator. Uh, so it's for Mr. Johnny Bocardi. Uh, I heard about that you uh, work in the past uh, in Iraq in the recovery plan of, uh, uh, of the Iraq and the, you uh, underline some problems linked to the um, social aspects uh, with the uh, religious division. So uh, can you can you please go deep in the problem, which are the, the main aspects of the problem? And uh, if you show uh, similarities and differences uh, with the I don't know, the case in which earthquake uh, um, struck uh, uh, a site. Thank you. Yes, of course, the situations are very, very different huh, from the earthquake that struck the Mark region and uh, what happened in Iraq, you know, fortunately. But uh, yes, to give you a little bit of um, background, uh, in Iraq, in the region, um, of Mosul, you know, the, the northern part of the country, as you know, um, there has been a war, you know, going on for many years. The, the, the population is uh, quite composite. There are different ethnic groups, some uh, uh, majority, uh, for example, you know, the Sunni Islamic, uh, you know, community, some minorities like the Christians, uh, the uh, Jews, uh, 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 and, uh, and other denominations. And um, of course, these communities are uh, because of the conflict and also because of uh, you know, many years of uh, difficult history, um, have a certain mistrust for each other, you know, and, uh, and the, the reconstruction process um, uh, was a very mo uh, particular moment where it was important to, to rebuild the trust and uh, strengthen the cohesion among different groups in the communities. And so it was uh, absolutely critical not to give to anyone the impression that you were neglecting them and that you were you know, placing your priority to somebody else. Every group you know, was afraid to be forgotten, to be uh, sort of uh, pushed aside or, or even excluded, you know, completely. And so uh, in uh, determining uh, how the cultural heritage of the city of Mosul was going to be recovered, uh, we made sure to include elements that were associated with each community, each group, and to involve especially the young people of uh, all uh, ethnic groups into the reconstruction of all the cultural heritage, not just each group you know, for its own, but uh, each group for everyone. Um, and this of course applies also to other initiatives, for example, training, uh, the development of um, skills that uh, would provide uh, young people with uh, employment opportunities related to cultural heritage recovery and so on and so forth. This is just an example I could go on, but I just wanted to underline uh, how important it is to keep these issues in mind, to, to apply a conflict sensitive approach to cultural heritage recovery because cultural heritage is so incredibly um, sensitive for these people because of course it is, uh, a symbol of their identity. And it is because the identities themselves were at the root of the conflict. Uh, when you touch cultural heritage, you know, uh, you have to be particularly careful. In the case of uh, Lemarck, of course, we are in a completely different situation. And uh, I suppose that there will be sensitivities among different groups, uh, younger, older, you know, but, but uh, nothing compared. Can I give just a, a small contribution to this uh, consideration? Also, is in the market, as you told, is uh, very different the situation. But uh, I have to remind you that as ministry during the earthquake, uh, we had to move uh, a lot of art objects from the churches and all the images, the images uh, um, buildings. 
And uh, we had to consider in other situations the devotional side of cultural heritage, because the devotion is a very, the sense of religion is a very strong emotion here in Marco region. And it keeps the population very mm, close to cultural heritage. They didn't want, uh, we moved the art objects, but uh, because they considered them as part of their religious life. But uh, uh, we had to consider also this side because for the population, this is very important, especially in a very dramatic situation and after the earthquake, because the population is stressed. And so it thinks to the divinity and the population feels very in a very strong way this link between people and cultural heritage seen as devotional objects in market we had to face this link because we um, saw the cultural heritage just as artistic objects but this is not the only side that the population see i had to give my impression. Absolutely. I think, uh, if I may, uh, the artistic historic uh, importance is only one of many aspects. And uh, of course, specialists uh, tend to concentrate on that. But uh, the reality is that there are so many other values associated with heritage. Lucia has raised her hand. I give her the floor to her for a quick intervention. Thank you. I wanted to say uh, something very quickly. Um, it's marginally to do with this uh, talk, with this webinar. Um, but in, in what I research and teach uh, the history of museums. So imagine when you're saying about the devotional aspect of um, the art, and we know that disaster and war and um, natural disaster uh, can provoke, and it has happened in L'Aquila, the disappearance of cultural heritage. And a lot of this art we find in museums and private collections. In Italy, we are very lucky to have the uh, Carabinieri for the protection of cultural heritage. Um, but one of the aspects we then come to fight academically is what happens when these elements of deep devotions end up in museums and they're just seen as objects. So I just wanted to put a salt in uh, people's minds about this, about the, the significance of heritage and the closeness of heritage to populations already connected and affected by disaster that then see their heritage disappear and become objectified in, um, in museums. That's all. This was a strong fear of uh, population of market region. And I don't see the same reaction from L'Aquila population. I ask very often myself why this is this, there is this difference. Because if you ask to L'Aquila population where, where the art objects are restored, um, they don't know. They don't know where the art objects are in these moments. I do, I do, but uh, it has been a very painful side of the uh, yes. of disaster. In my case, oh, please, sorry, sorry. No, 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 uh, just because L'Aquila is so much bigger um, and it goes, as Barnaby said, all decided from above. So uh, um, people like me and Barnaby, because we were very engaged, we were taken to see where the art was being restored, which was in a center uh, near Avezzano. Um, but the normal person doesn't know. No. And, but a lot of people complain that they don't know where our art is. No. Some are in museums in Rome, some are in... Uh, churches in other towns and people are not happy about this. No, no, but in Marche is very different because in Marche region there is a strong link uh, relationship between the population and their cultural heritage. We had to fight against the population to move these objects, but we had to do to save, to safeguard. We had the possibility to, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we had the possibility, but the possibility was given by the population because they very aware 
of the, their cultural traditions and they don't want to be separated from the cultural heritage. And this is a strong link. And uh, I think that on this strong link, we have to uh, build the reconstruction because if we don't build the reconstruction together with a population so strongly linked to cultural heritage, there are no, the, the, the reconstruction was, would be empty, I think. This is my opinion. I think it would be empty, so. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. I would like to give the floor to Manuel, who has raised his hand. We only have a few minutes left. Manuel, over to you. Ok, cercherò di essere velocissimo. Parlo da abitante delle aree interne, quindi delle zone colpite dal terremoto. Il fatto di essere legati è proprio perché, come dicevo, per noi eh, quelli che sono monumenti o quelle che sono delle opere d'arte sono parte della vita quotidiana. Faccio l'esempio con eh, la chiesa che è stata appena ricostruita grazie all'intervento di alcuni privati a Camerino. Quella non è solo la chiesa dove celebrare la parte religiosa, ma è parte proprio della vita comune. Per esempio, durante le rievocazioni storiche di Camerino si entra lì dentro con eh, tamburi e chiarine, proprio perché è parte di quello che è la nostra cosa. Quindi noi siamo molto, molto legati a questo qui. Nel momento in cui perdi la casa, non sai più dove andare, l'unico legame, l'unica eh, cosa a cui ti puoi aggrappare è appunto è quelle che sono le tue radici. A questo qua dovete aggiungere anche una cosa che è, diciamo, una, diciamo due cose più che altro. Eh, le Marche storicamente sono sempre state una, una zona eh, divisa e quindi con molti centri diversi. Per, per questo non abbiamo, come potrebbe essere, che ne so, per il Lazio una Roma o per la Toscana una Firenze che eh, sono quasi un simbolo per tutta quanta la zona. Noi siamo molto molto divisi e... La seconda cosa è che dalle nostre parti vediamo Ancona come un luogo molto molto lontano, anche da un punto di vista politico, perché appunto qui sono zone interne, qua c'è uno spopolamento e qua ci sono moltissimi problemi che sono iniziati già da prima del terremoto e noi siamo in prima linea a combattere, a cercare di tenere tutto quanto così. Quindi è normale che quando arriva qualcuno che noi vediamo come passato straniero, per noi è quasi un'invasione nel, nel nostro territorio. Thank you, Manuel. So resuming and um, summarizing what you said, uh, you, you give the example of the Church of Camerino, which was restored, and you emphasized how it is uh, uh, important to the community beyond even the religious meaning. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that it is used in festivals and events, and it's really part of your daily life. Um, you said that when people lose their houses and are displaced, the cultural heritage uh, is the only anchor, uh, is what keeps them together as a community. You refer to the fact that the Marche region uh, where Camerino is located, uh, unlike other regions of Italy like Lazio or Tuscany, does not have uh, a, a recognized uh, center like the capital Rome or the city of Florence and that uh, you are more spread out in a sense as communities, including some rural areas uh, which are very remote and which have lost part of their population due to migration. Hence the, the importance of maintaining uh, your links to, to the territory and, uh, and access to your cultural heritage. Thank you for, the, for testimony, testifying to, the, to your experience in this regard. Um, I was told some 10 minutes ago that we had another 10 minutes <laughs> to go. So I'm uh, again turning to Giovanni Sini to see if we should now wrap it up. And uh, uh, I would uh, allow the very last question from uh, Chanel Martinez, and then we, we can uh, conclude. Very Thanks. good, Chanel. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. We have a question, it says, we, see, uh, we can easily see the destruction of tangible uh, cultural heritage, while intangible cultural heritage is less visible, but most affected. What can you suggest uh, from a policy point of view to prepare and protect these uh, folkloristic events? Thank you, Chanel. It does not say to whom the question is asked, but uh, or it is for everyone in general. <laughs> Well, I would like to just maybe give a quick uh, response by saying that um, 
in the context of the UNESCO 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, um, uh, some uh, years ago, um, guidelines were developed to safeguard intangible cultural heritage in emergency situations. And these are accessible through the uh, website of UNESCO. Perhaps later on, I will share it with the, the, the staff of the project so that this can be also more widely disseminated. And there are some interesting uh, ideas there. But I see that Professor Zarnic has uh, asked to speak. Maybe he has uh, some answer to this question. Professor. Okay. Thank you very much. Just a comment. Uh, if you succeed to identify the significances of heritage as such, including tangible and intangible things, and link with the modern IT technologies, talking about so-called heritage BIM, you can uh, see interaction all this and protection each from one side to another side. So looking in tangible heritage, like a storytelling about the tangible heritage is one of the aspects. So more you link both, more you are successful in, in a preservation of this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes, I um, agree with you. I think um, we should imagine cultural heritage uh, like, um, a spider web with the nodes, which are the monuments, the museum, the, the art object, but also connections, which are the linkages between the people and these places or things that are important to us. And the purpose of uh, conservation is not just to look after the nodes, but uh, especially the connections. And uh, if these are recognized before a disaster happens, then it will be easier to to take care of them in the aftermath of a disaster. Um, I believe we have uh, exhausted the yes. questions on the chat, unless somebody has posted one in the past minute or so. And uh, we have reached the end of our allotted time. So I'm handing it over to Giovanni Issini again. And uh, I would like to thank uh, warmly the uh, speakers of this round table. Uh, Manuel, uh, Lucia, Barnaby, uh, Matteo, Rocco, and of course Anki from the Netherlands for sharing with us their insights and making this conversation so interesting and lively. Giovanni, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Mr. Boccardi. Since we are almost out of, out of time, in few seconds, I will try to summarize uh, the main message that uh, I'd like to take away today. First, thanks to Manuel, we looked uh, at a deep link between uh, architectural sites in the historical town of Camerino and the impact of the absence of local identity places in the social and cultural life of the cities. Then we saw that, uh, as well described in the field experience in L'Aquila, carried out by Lucia and Barnaby, digital technologies allow, especially to young people, to help their memory identity regeneration. So those technologies are not, not only important for experts, architects, conservators, but they are key tools also to allow participation in, in the key community choice. choice. Uh, then we considered also another point of view, Anki, Anki described the, the experience in the Netherlands. I found very interesting uh, the organization in Dutch Armed Force uh, and the dialogue between uh, these very consolidated institution such as uh, ERMI with uh, its own tradition and skills and uh, other uh, disciplines such as uh, psychology, art conservation and so on. Thanks to Matteo contribution, we argued local communities role after disasters may be fostered by policies which should promote people involvement through local, local cultural association. I think the main challenge uh, is often the, po the population, how, as we discussed today. Uh, it means that uh, the local communities simply disappear. 
they, are, they risk to disappear. This is a significant risk of many historical towns located in the market region inlands. Real communities move away and they become town for tourism or for summer holidays. Finally, we looked at the recent experience such as the 2021 earthquake in Croatia. Rocco introduced another side of the question. Territories affected by natural disasters with different ethnic and religious cultural groups. In this case, both the response and the reconstruction shall take into account the balance of needs from different uh, identities in the same area. So all these uh, topic that we discussed today will be uh, further investigated in the next two workshops, two webinars, and also we will keep in mind uh, all the, these contributions also during the workshops that will be carried out during the summer. With reference to the ne next events of the project, the welcome webinars will continue, uh, as you know, uh, with the, the Team A, the Cyprus uh, workshop attendees, next 9 April at 3 p.m. Italian time. And for the Team B, uh, the Portugal workshop attendees, next 16 April, uh, always at 3 p.m. Italian time. As already announced, uh, the workshop in Cyprus, unfortunately, will be performed online, while uh, we are still assessing the feasibility of the workshop in Guimarães. So you will be kept uh, up updated by mail during next days. Uh, about this uh, choice, uh, I think uh, there are no, uh, uh, we explained the reason uh, why uh, we turned to the online, uh, uh, with the, to turn the online the, the workshop in Cyprus. Uh, unfortunately, the situation for the COVID outbreak uh, is not so improved. Uh, and to, to let us uh, organize this workshop in, uh, in May. Uh, in any case, we will do our best uh, to, to uh, create other opportunities for the team A uh, in order to be meet uh, physically uh, in another event uh, in the next month. Uh, uh, during the project. In the upcoming days, you will receive a survey asking for feedback of this event that we performed today. So please uh, answer to the, to the survey. And uh, also we will send you a link to the recording of this event so, so that you can share it with your contacts, contacts and the social networks. Uh, I would like to say thanks again, uh, really, to all the speakers for the interesting talk and to the attendees for the active participation. And uh, finally, let me thank uh, Mr. Giovanni Boccardi for his uh, kindness and his commitment in assisting us during the organization of, of the webinar. I also would like to thank the project team for the effort in the webinar organization. Thanks a lot and uh, see you soon.